Ayushita, can you hear me? This is Mila. Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. But your voice is really fainting. Oh, okay. Let me come closer to the mic. Yeah, we're starting the session. Our next session is themed skill development, key to inclusive growth. The panelists of the session are Meera Shanoi, Chief Executive Officer, Youth for Jobs, S.V. Krishnan, Co-Founder, Dialogue in the Dark, Aradhana Lal, Vice President, Brand Communications and Sustainability Initiatives, Lemon Tree Hotels, Kanta Singh, Country Program Manager, UN Women. The moderator of the session is Mona Gupta, Chief Executive Officer, Domestic Workers, Sector Skill Council. Mona has over 30 years of experience in the government, international organizations, and industry associations. She's a public policy, management, economic, and social development specialist, and is an expert in branding, skill development, education, gender equality, among others. May I now request all on stage and request the moderator to introduce our panelists and begin the session. Over to you, Mona. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And... Uh pleasure having a very nice and esteemed panel along with me. Uh, welcome Mr. S.V. Krishnan, uh, co-founder Dialogue in the Dark. Uh, Mr. Krishnan, would you just like to say a line or two about Dialogue in the Dark? And this is a very curious uh, you know, uh, title for me and I'm sure the others are curious as well. So please, uh, if you could uh, sure. move on to the other panelists. Sure. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for your uh, introduction. Uh, so basically, Dialogue in the Dark is a very, very unique uh, thematic uh, experiential center where everything happens in complete darkness. And the whole idea of Dialogue in the Dark is to shed some light about uh, disability and social inclusion of the persons with disability in this country. <clears throat> I happened to visit uh, Dialogue in the Dark back in the US uh, almost 11 years back. I was so enthralled by this experience, so I decided to bring back Dialogue in the Dark to India. In a nutshell, what, does, what do we do in Dialogue in the Dark is basically we lead people, um, what we call the non-disabled people, um, typically people like you and me who could actually uh, see and hear and experience things using our other four senses. You are actually subjected to intense darkness for about an hour. And what you do in the dark is basically you go and touch and feel a lot of things. What is to go and play cricket in complete darkness? What it is to go and cross a shaking bridge in complete darkness? what it is to go and grab a meal in complete darkness. So the whole idea is there is a maze room inside dark where you are actually lost and you need to find your way back. So the whole um, experience of Dialogue in the Dark is themed around entertainment where you actually go and experience a lot of stuff uh, using your four other senses because you cannot use your sense of vision because it is so intense and engulfing darkness. So what's the whole idea is to basically uh, experience the life of these so-called uh, uh, blind or visually impaired person and the but of course the idea is not to experience the life of a blind but the idea is to experience your other senses and even through the whole exhibition because it is so dark you need some person to really assist you like how we go to a, a tourist place we have guides inside and these guides happen to be visually impaired people so that's the whole social twist to an otherwise immersive entertainment experience called dialogue the dark and we've been in india for the last 11 years and of course um, we, as I was uh, sharing uh, before the panel began, we got a little more darker in the last uh, 18 months um, because of the pandemic. We had come to a standstill mode right now. Uh, but otherwise, we've been existing in India for the last 10 and a half years before the pandemic. And we have welcomed more than half a million visitors to Dialogue in the Dark across our four or five centers that we built on a temporary and permanent basis in India across the cities. And we've been able to create uh, jobs for visually impaired, hearing impaired, uh, speech impaired, and also people with uh, mobility disability. We've been able to create about 10,000 job offers for them, and we've been able to skill train about 6,000 of them, and we have eventually been able to create jobs for about 4,000 persons with disability in the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krishnan. Uh, moving on to uh, Mrs. Kanta Singh and uh, who does not know UN Women, and this uh, brings me to the very important saying which I first read in 1985 or 1990, which said that it is it is from UN Women, and one of their first published uh, documents on women participation, where it said that women hold up half the sky. 
so it has stayed with me till today and somehow you know i i happen to it's become my favorite quote so welcome uh, mrs kanta singh uh, maybe uh, a brief introduction also about your current work and what is un women focusing on right now sure thank you mona and thank you uh, for inviting me to the panel uh, meera ji shrinivas krishnan um, and other other panelists i'm really happy to be on the same panel uh, see being a un organization uh, we work on different issues uh, un as you know is an intergovernmental organization we support the government in uh, in um, doing different things for example um, as un women we provide technical support to the government on gender issues uh, we look at inclusion of women in decision making we look at women in everything that government does so we are looking at programs policies budgets and and also implementation on the ground in india un women is just ten years old before that it used to be unifem i don't know if you remember that yes so and so in that sense we are one of the youngest agencies of the un um and in uh, we we started with a couple of core issues that we work on political economic uh, empowerment of women we work on a lot on violence against women um uh, and which is also one of the most critical factors women are not able to use uh, skilling opportunities that they have um we also provide support to the government as i said uh, on on the normative framework if the government has to report on cedo or government has to report on upr or anything we provide technical support to the government there uh, but most importantly um we have the pulse of women Uh, in a, in in, um, in everything that we do we uh, work a lot on the ground for last 10 years i have been personally working on skilling and entrepreneurship for rural women um, i joined un women 2 years back uh, but before that i was part of undp and meera ji has seen our work there and we have worked together there so uh, and there also we were working with women and girls and that has been the focus area and in every the last thought from my side is that everything that we do we keep women at the center of of um of the work that we do um and also the the intersectional issues like violence is also a major part thank you i'll come back later thank you thank you uh, kanta ji and now coming to mrs meera shunoy another uh, well known and understood uh, a uh, professional and ceo of uh, youth for jobs who's actually uh, you know making policy and putting that into practice for all of us so meera ji welcome to the panel and a few lines about your current work and uh, what would you like to bring into focus today uh, to begin with thanks mona and it's so lovely to be among friends kanta whom i've not seen for a long time and krishnan huh. so thanks for bringing Thank us you. all together um i've been working in the field of skilling under privileged youth, youth for jobs for a long time in senior government positions in fact i had two stints with the government um then consulting for the world bank the undp Uh, and then i decided that when i set up something of my own i wanted to do something different i chose disability because if you look at statistics 80% of the world's disabled are in the developing countries like india uh, girls with disabilities are the most vulnerable so i said okay then maybe in my last avatar what i should do is to work in a most vulnerable space um and it was work which was not been done in india at scale before because um, when we entered this space when i set up youth for jobs 9 years back uh, people were there were some people who were working but very small numbers looking at urban youth with disability uh, it's been a very nice 9 years journey Uh, what is our strategy and today i'm happy to say we are the largest in south asia in this space so what do we do we work at two three levels because disability is complex 
One is we work on changing mindsets of three C's, what I call. One is the village community because they think disability is a curse and you need to change those mindsets. Otherwise, you won't get any enrollments in your sitting classes. The second is uh, colleges because we work with the educated youth. And the third is the companies because they need to absorb our youth and give them jobs. We do skilling. We began with skilling for rural youth with less educated. But today we have a large college program where we work with universities and colleges to skill educated youth with disabilities. We work on knowledge through our center of inclusion by publishing two studies every year. We did one on the banking and finance, in fact, where uh, Dr. KP really supported me by launching it not once but twice. He came with me to Karnataka, where the bankers are, and in Mumbai also, and that influences policy. We work in schools, and last but not the least, I have a portal called Not Just Art, which works with artists with disabilities. Last year, we did an award for these artists to UNESCO. So it's a fairly comprehensive life, life cycle kind of approach which we do. The work is extremely challenging as anyone who works in this field will tell you. But also Mona, it's very, very inspirational, full of compassion. So it keeps you plodding on the journey of learning. True. Thank you. Thank you, Meera ji. Uh, I think, uh, and just to briefly add something about the Domestic Workers Sector Skill Council, uh, we are the only council of its kind at a national level, uh, which is dealing with a sector comprising of domestic workers and caregivers. So, so we have a saying here in our sector that people who bring glitter to, their, to our lives how about giving them back, you know, bringing glitter to their lives? And we saw that they were the worst affected, you know, when uh, last year the lockdown started happening. In fact, most of the migrant workers, apart from, you know, the MSME or construction workers, many of them were actually domestic workers and caregivers. Today, the need for caregivers is very high. In fact, we have a kind of demand for caregivers that we are unable to meet. And uh, uh, incidentally, you could say, or by default, women, transgenders, PWDs, they all form a part of our you know, catchment area, our supply base. So somewhere uh, where all of you are specializing and working in those areas, we you know, sort of converge those areas together and, you know, you people are, you know, your organizations are very uh, relevant to the work also of Domestic Workers Sector Skill Council. So with a few of these works, uh, I would like to begin with the Q&A here. Something that uh, was felt by me very curiously, what do you think has changed in the definition of inclusivity? Has it changed? Has it evolved? Has it, uh, you know, been understood? Because uh, we do have the three or four phrases with us. But do you think we need to work on the definition of inclusivity to make more real work happen? So it's open to all the panelists and anybody who would like to respond. So may I? Yes. Yes. Please. Uh, so, so I, I don't, uh, so I'm not a, uh, really, other than women, I don't have much experience of working with other groups. Um, what I would like to say is that definitely that's what I have seen. There is definitely more awareness about issues of inclusion now. There are more people talking about it, which is great. Also, more young people are taking up issues of inclusion. And when they're talking about inclusion, they don't put them in different categories. The exclusion of voice is also one of the things that they talk about. So I, I am very hopeful that things will get better from here, number one. 
Having said it, uh, I'm not saying everything is hunky dory now. Things are, are looking very rosy. Things are, things are very fine now. Nobody needs to do anything. Though there's a lot that needs to happen, and that's how people like Miraji and Krishnan and people, more people like them, are also working in the space. Uh, so that's point number two. Third is that I was thinking that there are several opportunities where we miss the the essence of inclusion. Um, you know, even in panels today, you will find only men talking about water issues. I'm really surprised sometimes. We are talking about transgender people and we don't get even a single person to represent them or people with, with the, who are differently able. Uh, so, so every time you see those things on Twitter and you have to remind the, the panelists um, and that why don't you speak up? Don't go to the panels where you don't see inclusion. These are and these are some of the thought leaders, by the way. Uh, on women's issues, I'm very, very sure that this is still an afterthought. That you know, women also, whereas we are 50 percent LDS, say half we we make half the sky, and yet you have to remind the organizers several times that you know, um, women do exist and their opinions do matter and their issues are slightly different than than the general issues. And so is the case of all the categories of people who have been excluded um, historically. And time has come that we start doing some justice to, to everyone. And I was just thinking, and I wrote to Vikas Khanna during the COVID, he had a great food program um, which was running into millions every day. And I was just saying, we have uh, a not trans people, but LGBT community people who are either begging or into sex work or do different things. And I was saying, if we employ these people to distribute food, uh, when the free food was distributed, can you imagine the mindset change that happens in one one stroke? If instead of receiving stuff from people, if they start becoming uh, people who give food and other stuff to people, things would have changed. And mindset, though, is a major issue. And one of this, this is my last thought. Mindset, though, it, it's difficult to change. But I also see mindset changing in a minute like this. Um, and I always give the example that in Haryana, when girls were not even allowed to wear jeans, now parents are taking their daughters for to Akhara's when the girls started bringing medals. So mindset changes. Mindset, mindset changes. Very, very fluid. You know, when we change the role, we, we make them service providers, people start thinking about them differently, but we miss these great opportunities. And that is the, a common loss that all of us have, and everybody has abilities. Nobody is born without any ability. So I'll stop here and let the speakers who are experts uh, on the issue. Uh, can I go next, Krishna? Yes. Yes, yeah, of course. Please. Okay. Uh, one thing I find is that if you look at uh, companies, their definition of inclusion is slowly broadening. At one time, inclusion used to be just gender. Now, disability is slowly getting added to the agenda. LGBT is getting added to the agenda. So these are slowly but steadily, the definition of inclusion is getting broadened. But I think... Um, the biggest challenge in a country like India is the fact that uh, A, 69% of India is the villages. And um, second is if you look at uh, the markets, it's the MSME. And I think in these areas, uh, the challenge, the challenges of inclusion are, are yeah. really large. I don't think they're even thinking of inclusion, frankly, you know. So when you look at India, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the geography of it and uh, the way uh, whether the labor markets are distributed or the, um, the rural belt of ours is distributed, which is actually the real India. And if you want to make change, that's where you need to change. So the change which has happened, the second major factor, I think, why inclusion is not getting mainstream yet is the fact that uh, no one believes or not many believe in measurements. So 
um, unless impact is measured and measured, I don't think you can make real change. Because hard data is what can really show people uh, how inclusion benefits, you know, how inclusion helps business, how inclusion helps the people take over. So while uh, baby steps are being made, and I must say invisibility, the current government has come out with a very good policy, the right to PWD Act. But you know, a policy happening and a policy getting implemented again is such a large issue. So I think baby steps have been done, but we have a long, long way to go before um, real inclusion gets happened. And uh, to me, the definition of inclusion is when they get totally mainstream, when you don't differentiate them from the others, and when their voices are heard, as Kanta said. When the voices of the poor, when the voices of the disabled, when the voices of women who are from underprivileged families, when I think they become leaders and their voices can be heard by all of us, that's only when we can say, um, inclusion has happened. Absolutely. Uh, well made points, uh, Meera ji, and I agree with you because uh, measurement and implementation is a challenge in the informal sector and I will talk about it a little later. I would like to hear Mr. Krishnan's viewpoint on the same also. Um, I think Kanta rightly said, I think in most of the forums, uh, men do the talking, so I'm very glad it's the first forum where we also have a man. <laughs> so I think truly uh, it's inclusive. Our, our panel is inclusive and uh, uh, there's only there's no men, there's one man here. So I think it's perfect. <laughs> but I think true inclusivity to me uh, is also in terms of mindset. I think Meera very rightly pointed out, uh, we have wonderful laws. We have uh, created a lot of effective laws. But I think what's happening currently is the implementation challenges that India faces. So knowing is not enough. How do we apply our knowledge? Uh, I think a uh, lot of uh, compelling statistics actually point to the fact that inclusivity is uh, only in words and not in its true spirit right now. I know it can be a very uh, sweeping statement, but uh, if one has to ponder on uh, what do we do? Typically, if you see in the post-pandemic uh, times, uh, even before the pandemic, I'm sure Mira would agree, in spite of the good work uh, most of the people in the sector are doing, uh, disabled people with disability are the last to hire and the first to be fired. If there's a there's a challenge, there's a slowdown. There's like, even before the pandemic broke, I think because of the GDP was not growing the way the corporates were expecting, uh, automatically what happens is the vulnerable groups or the people who have been actually bordering on what we call as charity hiring or hiring uh, with a cost, or people talk about uh, you want to kind of uh, build optics around uh, uh, profit with a purpose, uh, a lot of hiring do, do happen. Of course, I'm not taking away the fact that a lot of corporates are also hiring for the true abilities of the person with disability whom they have actually recruited. But I think the large fact remains that inclusivity is still remaining only in paper and not in the true spirit of it, which is very visible in a lot of statistics. I think uh, you take the Skill India mission, I think uh, the last five, seven years, I understand the total number of people who have been actually skilled in this country is close to about uh, a crore or uh, 10 million. Uh, whereas if you see the number of persons with disability, if you were to look at uh, matching statistics, we don't even have a number to actually uh, write home about. So we still have in the disability space, inclusion is reduced to optics and reduced to uh, isolated uh, islands of inspiration, or you have a lot of, uh, or maybe you could talk about uh, few selected uh, stories of success. I always keep uh, sharing this example. Of course, I wish Aradhana was here from uh, Lemon Tree. Um, the true inclusivity will be to actually in invite the best practices of corporates. For example, if there is one a Lemon Tree that is hired and showcased to the world in the last five, seven years, that truly persons with disability are capable of uh, you know, discharging their duties to the fullest extent in the way a person with no disability can do, uh, why are we not having the entire uh, spectrum of hospitality sector actually embracing that? So that's true inclusivity to me. QSR, you have few restaurant examples of uh, uh, Pizza Hut or uh, KFC, yeah, but, but uh, I think there are 164 QSR. 
there are 164 QSR companies in this country. So can we look at inclusivity going to that level? So to me, inclusivity is uh, we should improve both depth and width in terms of the intervention and uh, look at uh, disability hiring, not from a, a sense of CSR or charity, but truly inclusive. That's right. Point well made, uh, Mr. Krishnan. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, it leaves me very little to add here because it gets covered. Uh, I, you know, when uh, DWSSE took up a special project to train transgenders uh, and we had difficulty in finding a real company, you know, corporate partner. Uh, but Bita Nirvana came forward, accepted it, and it, took, it also took them time to understand but uh, we also, you know, emphasize the fact that if you do it and people are actually being served by trained, uh, you know, transgenders, it would lead a very good message and spread across. So it could only spread across in their own value chain, you know, their franchisees. That would be a huge difference. So they agreed to come across and although it's a small batch to begin with, but, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, taking cue from what you are saying, Mr. Krishnan, that it should be both, uh, you know, in depth and width. So here I think, and I really wish Aradna had uh, been able to join us, uh, you know, branding. Actually branding not in the sense of optics, but actually putting out into the media some of these initiatives talking about these initiatives. In fact, our event, which unfortunately got cancelled due to a sudden lockdown in March, you know, on Women's Day was actually about climbing frames where we wanted to showcase some of these achievers, you know, actually bring them forward to show that how they fought uh, dignity, livelihoods and all these issues and move forward. So somewhere I feel even, uh, you know, a positive uh, reflection in the media. You know, when people talk about inclusivity, it is like from the point of view of pity, like you said, or CSR. And it is not like real time, uh, you know, uh, what do you say, a realistic inclusivity. So this is what we thought was also a good way. And DWSSC is actually now going to be doing going forward on their website is actually talking about these real stories and the real heroes. So this becomes an inspiration for many. And even in our mobilization, uh, that is what we do uh, with our catchment areas. We actually talk to people about and we bring them forward to speak. We don't get speakers from anywhere. We don't hire experts on trainers. And we actually have people who have been in the job to come and talk about. You know, For instance, one of our transgender trainee is now with the National Backward Classes Commission. She actually started as a uh, you know, a cleaner, a janitor, uh, but now she has moved on to the office work, you know, because she could gather some file, filing skills and, you know. So we actually make sure that she is represented in most of our meetings, you know, and that is how I thought uh, would answer your concerns about how do we spread this word and message across. So uh, going from here, uh, my next uh, area of concern which I'm sure all of you have also talked about, is the measurement, particularly in the informal sector. It becomes very difficult even to gauge whether they're being paid the minimum wages. And uh, while we have a, you know, while we're talking about actually real-time inclusivity, real-time inclusivity also requires that we know what are the wages they are being paid. Are they being treated fairly? Are they being, you know, actually provided decent livelihoods? So even though we have the Social Security Code as a policy measure announced in 2020, uh, which also includes our domestic workers and caregivers and all the gig workers, how do we implement these on the ground, especially keeping in mind the informal sector and other end users? MSME, as you rightly talked about, Meeraji, what do you think could be some takeaways for our listeners, our audience, and our uh, partner organizations as to, you know, some very quick ideas on this uh, from the panelists here? Yeah. Shatina? Yeah, please. 
Uh, I think we should look at the entire uh, uh, life cycle of uh, mobilization to uh, skilling to then post-skilling related issues like employment and probably before skilling, you're talking about the measurement. I think we need to look at the entire continuum. Uh, one of the things I uh, of, was of the view was, as it is, if you really see persons with disability are not even exposed to any kind of formal skill sector, skilling itself, I'm not even talking about employment sector or job sector, in terms of skilling. So typically, as rightly pointed out by Mira, 67% of India's persons with disabilities live in rural areas. So we really don't have... Uh, who don't have any access to formal education, they don't access health, they don't access... So they are already uh, kind of complex with so many other problems. So I think the uh, important aspect that we need to do is till you reach a threshold in terms of certain numbers, so critical numbers, it will be too hard to comprehend on these larger... Maybe it's very critical in terms of measurement, in terms of what is the kind of salaries they're earning, or if they're on a self-employment mode, what kind of wage are they really making? It's a very, very important measurement metric. But we have larger issues even before we actually arrive at the measurement metric. So are they really able to get to, it's typically like how we had the uh, free midday meal scheme to actually woo kids to actually come to school. So they're not coming to the school to actually learn. They were coming to the school because they could be fed, you know, they were suffering from a problem of malnourishment. So I think a similar approach should be looked at from a person's disability sector also. So PWT, I would say, is very akin to what the kids of India went through and how we actually looked at school as a place to solve a malnourishment issue. So I think measurement is still a long way, whether you are looking at what is the kind of skill they got measured or how do they assess their uh, skills, they assess their knowledge, they assess their learning, and then followed by what kind of job they take. Is it a self-employment, wage employment? Did they meet the minimum wages standard? So I think to um, this is something I even actually shared with uh, the National Skill Council to say that to look at probably uh, applying all the norms of the common uh, norms of uh, NSDC or uh, uh, NSDA is too early. I think we are still too early at the stage of uh, the life cycle of skilling to uh, livelihood creation for persons with disability. So in my yeah. opinion, assessment is not uh, such a major challenge that one should look at to solve today. Uh, but uh, if I would just uh, like to uh, ask you a small question as an add-on here, Mr. Krishnan. Uh, when we say, I understand when you say measurement, you know, as it sounds, is typically a very formidable exercise, particularly for the informal sector. But then how do we move on to making more realistic policy? How do we have a policy direction? Because we know that there has been a certain stagnancy in many areas, right? Uh, while, uh, as rightly mentioned, we have more awareness, the younger generation is more inclusive. And now seeing them, I think the elder generation or the previous generations are also the acceptability has increased a lot. Uh, but then uh, even a basic measurement or um, you know, is required to understand whether we are on the right path or not. I mean, if... No, I'm, I completely agree with you. I'm not saying that we should uh, probably not consider uh, measurement uh, or assessments as a very important uh, um, step or stage. But I think it's an evolving process. I think currently the policy should be more focused on getting more and more people into or mainstreaming or including them into the formal skilling sector. That itself is still not happening. So we are talking about the next question is, let's say in India, I think the statistics talk about 10 million youth um, who have reached the right age in terms of um, to be qualified for a skilling or to be qualified to go into a job. So where are these 10 million uh, young PWDs in this country? Where are they getting skilled? This should be a, a larger focused area or a focused uh, a priority today. Uh, than looking at uh, assessment, which is probably a subsequent step. I'm saying yeah. the initial step itself uh, is a measurement, challenge. Measurement, uh, we would not, uh, we are not, I think, uh, talking about assessment really. Uh, but say, for instance, Social Security Code provides for insurance, right? Now, if my domestic workers or caregivers are working in various households, some of these households are one of the richest households belonging to high net worth individuals of Delhi. Uh, but yet, it is very difficult for me to understand whether 
they are getting the wages they deserve are they aware of their rights are they insured because what we see during the pandemic and saw two of our surveys last year and this year have shown that uh, they even had difficulty in getting relief because their employers did not care really to actually put them on the social security uh, uh, you know uh, websites or uh, you know giving them a getting them a social security number you know except if they reached out on their own so i think that is my concern here maybe kanta ji if you can add anything that you and women uh, has initiated in this area yeah so thank you monna uh, we do a lot of work with formalization of employment actually and and because 90% and above in fact more than 90% people are still working in the informal sector and here i'll stick to women because that's what i know uh, um women are they make the uh, they, they are in majority as far as informal work is concerned it's very difficult to measure what kind of salaries they are getting whether they have some social security or not it is left to the individual employer actually and i have i have two two different sets of uh, experiences mona one is where we failed when we were working on skilling and employment we failed because what are we talking about the, look at the look at the scenario in a rural area where women we are we are mobilizing women to go and uh, join the skilling institutions now where are the skilling where is the pmkk uh, it is at district headquarter level a woman say in a, in a closest area i would say 30 kilometers 25 kilometers a woman who is not earning right now first who is going to target her a man a young boy goes to speak to villagers and find out where how, how to identify these women now which parent in rural india is ready to send her girl, send their daughter with a young man so it starts from it's a very fundamental truth uh, then who pays her daily expenses to go to the training institution if the family is already under pressure it's difficult to get money for daily bus fare number 2 when she goes to the skilling institution generally male trainers and meera ji would would bear me out here none of the trainers are the weakest link in the in the entire skilling system because they don't have a career path they have they, they don't have domain knowledge in many cases because what happens is uh, when you are taking the master or the chief instructor from a factory he or she is the best trainer but this person has had some experience without understanding what kind of job this person would be required and as, so the language is very masculine language is very exclusive in that sense the girls find themselves very uncomfortable during these environments then i will go back to you and before that they sit in the classroom the counselor uh, who is who is speaking to them first when they reach the center then say okay welding um no there are no girls here you will be the only one doing it now the same counselor if you change he or she changes the language saying there are many employers who are looking for women welders so you will be in minority but you will be the first one to be picked up so here is an opportunity for you now the same situation can be changed and after seeing one girl three more will come uh so that's another problem when that it comes for hiring really women don't get hired they are the last ones and i can understand no last one when i'm saying people with disabilities should would be the last ones but then women are also not a priority for hiring because women are seen to be problems that they will get married because they are in that age group or they'll have children or they'll have problem they'll have household work um so so Uh, as a result you can see that post pandemic there are not even 20% women working in the formal sector now and the number is de- declining every day um and there's a lot that could happen here even with the employers i have seen um, um when employers have taken interest and they have invested to have more women in the workplace women have stayed and they have performed yes, very well that's right when they when it is a charity activity for them saying just for the sake of diversity they hire women it doesn't last very long doesn't because they haven't changed the fundamental nature of work women work differently women they can't work 12 hour shift because they have to go back home and their unpaid care work is only their business 
the last they thought from my side is the salary is so low, particularly for the for the uh, entry level jobs, that if a woman has to go 30, 40 kilometers, uh, she has to pay at least in Haryana, I, I can say for, for example, 3,000 rupees bus pass, government of Haryana. Yeah. She gets about 9,000 in the beginning, 8 to 9,000. If she gives 3,000 there, yeah. she's at least 6,000 and she spends 10 to 12 hours outside the house. Now, family members are not so generous that they will give her food when she comes back. She has to come back home, take care of the children, take care of the family members, take care of the household work. Only thing that I can think of is that there's a lot that can happen in terms of the paid care work sector that is still not developed in this country, where women, where people uh, who have disabilities, for example, people who are, who are LGBT community people, people from rural areas can do a lot of work we need to develop that economy so that more and women, more women get that support and these women also get employed. So this is what my thought is. Also demand-led training, like what I listened to Dr. KP and I yes. have been saying that I have also seen when the industry is putting money to train as per their requirement, the results are much better than you have your next other skilling programs there's no premium on those skilling programs, sorry. Um, we have to align the, the exact skills that are required by the industry, and th that is changing every day. So, and unfortunately for us, last thought is uh, the, nothing requires you to lift weights now. There's automation is happening. So it's not that jobs are getting lesser. The nature of jobs is changing. And all these people who we are talking as excluded people can do those jobs very well without thinking that you have to lift weights. That is the only thing men can do better by this. So thank you, Kantaji. I think uh, the point that you mentioned about, uh, so that is what even the WSSC is actually doing, formalizing paid care work. And now our focus has actually moved. We are engaging very intensively and uh, actively on a work footing with all our partners, industry and otherwise to actually reach out to the rural areas. We want to create jobs where they are needed, you know, so that people don't have to unnecessarily migrate and come back, you know. So uh, I think uh, that is where uh, we are happy that we are also in line with uh, thinking of organizations like UNW and uh, we are on the right path also there. So uh, coming to the, I think, the last two, three minutes of our session, uh, I, before I give, I think Aradna has joined us. Aradna? Yes, I'm here. My, um, I just got the link actually two minutes ago. I'm actually in another session. Oh. So I've come out of that session for a few okay, minutes. Okay, okay. No my problem. camera is acting up a little bit. So I, as in my Wi-Fi is acting up. So I'm keeping the camera off. I'm just keeping my voice on. No, no. Uh, that's my apologies. Problem. And I can see many friends on the panel. Hi, Kanta. Hi, Krishnan. Hi, Meera. I can see you guys. Hi, hi. How are you? All right, good. So tell me what to do, Mona. Uh, no, nothing to do. I think uh, Lemon Tree has been doing an Aradhana. I think uh, just to refresh your memory, we were on a couple of panels on sustainability a uh, while ago, I think four to five years back. Yes. And uh, that's how I recalled. And I think Lemon Tree was one of the front runners in terms of you know looking at employability and inclusivity so i think just a quick question to you uh, before we wrap up this round is yes, uh, yes. how do you think as an employer what is the kind of you know we talked about this term branding and branding not in terms of marketing or uh, you know polishing our image for just the sake of optics, but what is the kind of branding in terms of real policy does this sector need so that we can be much wider in our spread, much deeper in our impact, much more realistic? Just if you have something in mind on that. Signal is really troubling me, so I lost a few of your words, but it's all right. So if we look at the idea of inclusion and diversity from uh, the lens of industry, so we are lemon tree hotels. We run 84 hotels in 52 cities across India and outside India. And we hire people with disability as a part of our HR policy. In fact, 20% of our workforce is either a person with disability or a person from an economically and socially marginalized background. 
so when you look at this as a culture when you look at this as a business practice of our organization it sort of automatically fits in with the brand because you are looking at it from a strategy perspective you are looking at it from the lens of a overall company contributing to the community while still maintaining their business model we are not hiring people with disability out of charity we are hiring them in a very structured process of doing job mapping of understanding where the disability does not matter to that role like the disability does not come in the way of the role at all so if we hire someone who's deaf or we hire someone with a physical handicap or somebody is autistic we are doing it in a manner in a very carefully planned and thought out manner so that that special employee continues to contribute to the productivity otherwise you cannot make this your practice you cannot make this your culture if you run it as a uh, charitable uh, initiative when you ask me that how does this work from a branding perspective i think it just we lost your voice sir as I think uh, we lost I, her voice. Yeah. yeah, we've lost a connection lost as well. Oh, yeah. Hello, can you hear yeah, me? She's back. Oh, I think okay. it's hello. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can hear you. So yeah, if you would like to conclude it. Hello. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, we can. We can. We Actually, can. I'm flipping between two connections, so I'm having a difficult oh. day. And uh, one day when I meet Airtel, I'll have something to say to Airtel, but that's all right. So um, I was trying to say that when you look at it from a branding lens, it's more about company strategy and company branding. It's not the typical marketing branding. That is not our effort. Yes, we might talk about it on our social media as part of many things we talk about, but we are not trying to use it as a leverage from a marketing perspective. We are using it as a HR practice. we are using it as part of our business model because it is making sense to us people with disability yes. do have ability people with disability have high vigor and eagerness and enthusiasm and if we train them properly you know the whole onus lies on us we must train them properly for that role and that task and they'll be able to do it if we don't understand how to train them so example if i have to train someone who's deaf i must do it in indian sign language there's no other way to do it if i have yeah. to train someone who's autistic or has down syndrome i'll have to do it through some role plays and demonstrations by making them sit in a classroom and giving them a lecture it will be hard for them to absorb all that information they can do it better by observation i'm giving you very simple example so i think the the way in which a company can um do a job mapping process do a sensitization process within the company and make sure the training is aligned to that person with special needs this can be your business model you can do it very easily and therefore it becomes a part of company strategy and branding thank you thank you aradhna thank you and to conclude this wonderful session that we had with uh, our so down to earth and candid panelists i must say although i'm sure we have not been able to really you know put into words a policy direction or the way forward but i think we got a wonderful swot analysis here you know and uh, i think the key things uh, we got into it was that inclusion and informality are you know undeniably uh, you know intertwined and connected you know so to address one we have to address the other and what would be the ways going forward uh, we've also heard about uh, you know how um, you know mainstreaming uh, depends on a little bit of understanding and measurement when i say little bit of understanding and measurement i don't mean understanding it little but uh, baby steps in understanding and measurement would take it forward uh here i would just like to add that dwsc is also initiating uh you know a voice uh, app you know and proposing to initiate a voice app where you know it would connect to different paid care workers and uh, domestic workers who can actually just by uh, on the app say that are they happy with their work circumstances are they feeling dignified do they feel inclusive 
So this is our little step towards measurement that we propose to initiate. And of course, uh, uh, not last but uh, and the least, uh, it is not in the least, that branding should be realistic. It's not about it, uh, marketing, but it is actually understanding the true human resource behind it. And I think with Industry 4.0, as also mentioned by our esteemed panelists, uh, there will be a lot of opportunities which are not uh, relying on gender typified roles or on, you know, the ability of a person. So those are being well taken care of. Uh, in fact, in our own organization, one of my best employees, which I was not aware of initially, has a degenerative eye disease. And, uh, uh, but he has remarkable sick skills and, uh, you know, other sensible skills, which was very amazing when I learned that, uh, you know, he's suffering from this kind of a degenerative disease. So with technology, Industry Point 4, I think we have a huge way forward and opportunity to make it deeper and wider. So to thank you all and uh, thank you for your time and your input. As I said, very candid and realistic input is what we really need uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mona, for wonderfully concluding that session. Thank you, all the panelists, uh, for sharing your insights and making those suggestions. I'm sure they will reach the right uh, stakeholders, concerned stakeholders. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. you may now uh, close your uh, windows, uh, so you will automatically log out of the session. <laughs>